G'day, g'day. What you are about to witness is, in my opinion, one of the best commutes in Sydney. So today I will be riding from Leichhardt in Sydney's inner west to Circular Quay. Uh, and then I'll catch the ferry to Manly and then I will ride to Manly Vale. So, obviously the bike train combo is an absolute classic. That is a well-known, well-known combination. Um, whether you're parking your bike at the train station or taking it on the train, I use it all the time. But I feel like the bike ferry combination is a little bit less common. I think only just because ferries are a little bit less common. I do quite often see people taking their bike on the Manly Ferry. So, as you can see, I am approaching the City West Link, which is probably the ugliest road, I think, in the Inner West. Oh no, second ugliest. Parramatta Road, I'd say, is worse. Um, if you want to hear me complain about Parramatta Road for about 11 minutes, I would recommend my video about Parramatta Road and how to improve it. Um, so the reason you may have noticed that there was a little bit of a bike lane thing to the left that I did not, um, I did not use because I have never seen it work properly. The light just stays red the entire time. It's a bit sketchy. So what I'm doing now is, you know, a little bit illegal, um, a little bit cheeky just riding the wrong way in the bike lane, but there's plenty of room for it. Uh, what I'm about to do here actually is also illegal, I think, riding over the zebra crossing, but that's all right. So this is Lilyfield Road. Um, Lilyfield Road, I believe it used to be the most popular road for commuting via bicycle uh, in the inner west. I don't know if it still is. I doubt it. I rarely see people biking on, uh, on Lilyfield Road anymore. Uh, and the reason for that is because due to West Connect's construction, they removed the overpass that went over Victoria Road. Um, because before the overpass was removed, it was a really direct link from the Bay Run to Anzac Bridge. Um, and it basically ran, it, like it runs parallel to City West Link. So it's a very direct route into the city from, you know, whether you're going from Lilyfield, Leichhardt, Haberfield, wherever. Um, it's probably the most direct route. And the, you know, the bike lanes were this sketchy when it was the most popular uh, cycling route in the inner west. There were plans, I believe, to build a two-way separated cycleway. For some reason, those plans involved making part of Lilyfield Road one way, and then Jamie Parker, I think his name is, the um, representative for Balmain, uh, in the Senate, I think, um, or in whatever, you know, however state government representatives work, I think it's the Senate, um, but he, he blocked it from happening, I believe, but they are currently doing construction, um, for a new park along there and a new overpass, I believe. It'll be interesting to see how it all turns out. I'm actually making a video about that at the moment, about Anzac Bridge and how the walking and cycling capability of Anzac Bridge should be replaced with um, Glebe Island Bridge, which you may have heard of, sorry, you may not have heard of, and that's because it is currently out of action. So these lights always take forever. Uh, Victoria Road is one of the reasons that Glebe Island Bridge would be a better option because you wouldn't have to deal with Victoria Road. It's like, there is a reason I am not riding on the footpath to the left, even though that's technically where bikes are. I mean, bikes are allowed to go in the bus lane, obviously, but the intention is that 
that you cycle on the footpath on the quote-unquote shared path but it is so bumpy there are these little side streets 10 kilometer an hour shared zones but they don't have a raised intersection so it's like you're bumping up and down every little side street there is there's potholes there's you know there are random bus stops and poles and all kinds of see there's a random pole there and it doesn't you know it's yeah it's no good it's no good at all it's pretty useless um i saw some tradies hanging out like looking at the pole being like oh yeah that's no good um the other day maybe they're gonna upgrade this soon i hope so i don't know uh we'll see i also there's the fact that it is a shared path a shared path in a very complicated street also, this is ridiculous. This is, you can tell they just tacked this onto the side road, like, sorry, the car road, because it's like, it just goes, it's a really steep downhill and then a really steep uphill. Oh, that guy is impressive. I'm on an e-bike, e um, and he overtook me with just the power of his absolute, like, chad legs. I'm really, like, I don't know. That guy, you know... I feel like he's he's getting ready for the uh, the Tour de France. But yeah, there you go, the Anzac Bridge. You can see we're approaching it now. You can see the flag up there, the cool little I don't know steel cords. I guess I don't really know what you'd call them. Kind of anchoring it all in there. This bit is also pretty sketchy. There's a random lamp post in the middle. There are also speed bumps, um, which you know fair enough because there are people would be people coming up from the other ramp. But that's, once again, it's, that's why shared paths suck, because they're dangerous. Um, and they make things more complicated than they have to be. So you can see to the left, if you squint, there's the harbour bridge, the city skyline. You can't really see that well past the massive fence. Another advantage that Glebe Island Bridge would have over the Anzac Bridge. Uh, because you know it's not super high up so you wouldn't need the insane railing during peak hour I regularly overtake cars that are stuck in traffic going over Anzac Bridge which is a problem because in theory cars should be faster than an electric bike especially considering this is a, like a 70 kilometer an hour um, speed limit on this bridge and what's extra worrying is that the buses get stuck in traffic as well but like i said i am making a video about that that's the topic of my next video i just need to wait to hear back from a few politicians that i have emailed because it's you know there's no point trying to give a solution if i haven't reached out and seen what the best solution is by talking to people um city of sydney council is very pro glebe island bridge and another advantage that Glebe Island Bridge will have is that you don't need to go down this kind of zigzag here. Yeah, I'll tell you what, when I had an acoustic bike rather than an electric bike, um, this slope, it killed my legs. Uh, I, even in winter, often I would have to shower uh, whenever I'd go somewhere. And that being said, you know, it wasn't all bad. My legs were built like tree trunks for a while there uh, not so much anymore but yeah it was pretty crazy this separated bike uh bike path here is pretty new they built it i believe during 2021 when i wasn't living in sydney so it was a nice surprise to come back and see that they had built this when i had cycled this route regularly before it was here um, I think it's a really popular route because obviously it's the way into the city from Anzac Bridge. This area is nice as well. This was chaotic when it wasn't a separated cycleway because there'd be people... You'd have to make a right turn to get onto the Anzac Bridge on the way back from the city, which was never fun. Um, it's like waiting in a lane in the middle of traffic going both ways around you while you're just sitting there on a bike with no protection around you is never fun. So th this, uh, this separated cycle is like a massive, massive improvement. I'm really glad they built it. City of Sydney does a lot of good work with separated cycleways. But what's really interesting, and we'll get to that when I get to Manly, 
is that it's not all about the separated cycleways. So there's one to uh, get your noggins working. What else could it be about? Well, we'll, we'll find out when I get to Manly. Um, this bit of cycleway here has been here as long as I have lived in Sydney, I believe. So I moved up in 2018. Um, I'm pretty sure it's been here for a good long while. This intersection though, is as you can see, it's massive and there's no traffic. There is actually very rarely traffic going through it. It is super over-engineered. Honestly, I think it should just be a roundabout because everyone here is just like waiting. And there's so much waiting when people could easily have been going. So in Australia, I, we, I think our traffic lights are smarter than American traffic lights, but they're a lot dumber than European traffic lights as far as being able to act independently from each other based on sensing which cars are in which lanes and where they're approaching from, things like that. But, um, you know, that is not going to change anytime soon, I don't think. In Australia so I think to simplify things I, I reckon a roundabout with a like obviously with the cycle lane being um, obviously continuing through the roundabout like a footpath with a pedestrian crossing would so the cycle lane having priority to go through the roundabout um, kind of in the Dutch style I think at all of the traffic lights probably would make traffic flow a lot more smoothly there. This is just me guessing based on the amount of times that I have waited and I've seen others waiting, including people in cars, at the traffic lights when there is no traffic to wait for. This intersection, I think, is complicated enough that probably the traffic lights are merited. I don't know, it would be interesting to see this as a roundabout, though, especially Although if there was cyclist and pedestrian priority here, no cars would ever get across. So that's probably why, um, you know, that's if it were to stay as traffic lights, which I, you know, I think all of them will. I don't think this is an urgent priority for anyone, but if one were to stay as traffic lights, it would be that one because of the amount of pedestrians and cyclists. So this is Piedmont Bridge. Uh, bit of construction work going on, I don't know what they're working on. Uh, this goes between Piedmont and the CBD. So to the left we've got the aquarium, the zoo, Madame to whatever it is, the wax figure place. Um, And you can't really see, but there's a massive pedestrianized waterfront area full of very, very expensive restaurants uh, just below the bridge. So if I were to have gone down that escalator or some of the stairs, that's where I would end up. But I am now joining the walking and cycling part of, I think this is the Cahill Expressway. So this comes off, this is one of the exits for the Anzac Bridge for cars. Uh, and it, I'm going to be honest, completely ruins just this part of, it doesn't completely ruin this part of the city, but it's loud, it shades everything below it. Um, I'm not really a fan. There's talk about ripping parts of the Cahill Expressway down. That's mostly around Circular Quay. You'll see that when I catch the ferry, what that's like. There, you know, things are a bit tentative. I don't think anything's set in stone. I know some people want to. Um, Dominic Perrottet, the New South Wales uh, Premier, wants to, I believe. And who else wants to? Clover Moore, the mayor of Sydney, also wants to. But I think the problem is that it would be incredibly expensive because what Clover Moore also wants to do is 
to uh, underground the railway as well and you'll see why that'll be difficult when we get to circular key so for some reason on king street here you'll notice a cycleway ended just out of nowhere it doesn't even lead anywhere um this is weird this is really weird that it does that and it's actually really unsafe and it stops a lot of people getting to pit street which and you'll see when we get to pit street it continues it continues beyond Pitt Street to Hyde Park. Um, see, there it is. It's just so strange. I don't get it. Um, the City of Sydney Council want to build the middle of it. They're just waiting for approval from the New South Wales government. So I've contacted the New South Wales government about this uh, I'll put a link in the description if you want to as well because if everyone starts going like oh where's this random middle part of the King Street cycleway maybe they'll build it because they actually built the eastern part the part that we saw in front of me that led to Hyde Park very quickly once it was once the Castle Race Street cycleway was announced they decided to build the King Street East cycleway to connect it to Oh, I don't. I actually can't remember where they were connecting it to. I'll put a little map up on the screen um, that will show the cycleway plan. And this cycleway, the Pitt Street cycleway, is it was a COVID pop up um, cycleway project that was temporary. You'll see parts of it haven't been made permanent towards the end, but it was originally one way. I don't know why. Uh, and then everyone was like, what is going on? Why is this a one-way cycleway? And so they were like, okay. And then they made the temporary cycleway bi-directional. Um, and now they've made it permanent. And you can see to the left, the, there's a p pedestrian part. They also widened the footpath when they did the pop-up cycleway. Not many people are using it because it's, I don't know, I think it goes against a lot of people's instincts to step down into onto what looks like road because there's a gutter there. Um, or a curb there rather even though it's cobbled and it's obviously well not obviously but it's meant to be walked on it's not instinctual to walk on it um, but I'm sure at some point they will raise that extended part of the footpath up to the rest of it so here we are circular key and as you can see you've got the railway and then above it the Cahill Expressway and it just casts a shadow over the whole area crossing the tram here yeah, I crossed the tram before over George Street. Um, this goes to the eastern suburbs. That tram is fantastic. I like it a lot. Um, there's the Opera House. So this is part of the reason this commute is so good is because you see like all the iconic Sydney things. The Harbour Bridge. We'll get a view of that soon. Um, but yeah, to the right is the railway station. And above it like literally the roof of the railway station is a Cahill expressway um so you can see it continues off past there so i understand the the rationale behind wanting to underground the railway station because it also casts a, a shadow sorry underground yeah underground the railway station because it does also cast a shadow and limits the amount of open space around the wharves but you know I think I think there would be benefits to the Cahill Expressway being demolished while the railway was kept. As long as there was some kind of sound insulation around the railway and it was kind of beautified a little bit. Maybe add some fun ar architectural touches around it because at the moment it's pretty bare bones. It's just kind of like bare steel. Um, but I don't know. Let, let me know in the comments what you think about the whole Cahill Expressway. Should it go underground? Should it be... Sorry, should the railway go underground? Should it be demolished? Another reason the railway going underground would be incredibly expensive is because of its proximity to the ocean. Uh, so, I'm strapping my bike onto the ferry. The, these bike spaces are actually... There's a hook above them and you're meant to hang your bike off the hook. So it could actually fit a lot of bikes on these ferries. Um, doesn't work so well with my bike because it's a really heavy cargo bike. But if you had a lighter bike, for sure, for sure it would, it would be pretty easy. So there's the Harbour Bridge. This is the view from the back of the ferry. Uh, it is 
seriously a fantastic view. Like this is, it is great just seeing this every morning. There's the opera house coming into view. There's some random bloke just sitting on a chair, having a look around. Sydney Harbour Bridge and Opera House again. That grand old building is a museum of some kind, I believe. I can't actually remember what museum it is. There is Circular Quay Railway Station. Here you get a very clear look at the Kale Expressway and the railway underneath it. All right, a bit of a hardcore Henry moment here. You can see my arms like whoa, running, like some you know one of those action movies where it's like a GoPro POV shot or whatever. Um, yeah, I went here to get a view of the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House, and I believe, oh no, I'm just going to stare at the Harbour Bridge for a bit, that's fair enough, and the Opera House for a bit. Oh no, here we go, here we go, here, I'm, I'm going over to look at the Botanical, the Botanical Gardens, I think, is what is there, and you can see that white hook to the right. Uh, that is a new artwork, maybe only a couple months old, called Bara, and it is essentially it is modelled after they call um, it's a Gadigal word, and they're fish hooks made of bones used by like Aora women to obviously catch fish. And apparently, it was very common to see Aora women around the harbour in canoes fishing up until. I think like the late 19th century. So that artwork is, it's been made to celebrate the area's Aboriginal history. It's also been designed with the shape and the color for it to, it to really complement the Opera House and also the Harbour Bridge because of all the curves going on the white, which is obviously the white of the, the bone that it was made out of, um, that bars were traditionally made out of, but it's also the white of the Opera House sails, so it kind of, it, it's, it's been designed in a very considered way to almost connect Sydney's history with its present and make place for, or, or really make visible rather, Aboriginal culture around the city of Sydney, which, I don't know, I think it's a really good artwork, I like it a lot. So there are a bunch of navy ships over there by the looks of it. I don't know what they're doing there. I think that's some kind of naval port, but I actually have no idea. Actually, I'll tell you what I can do, I can just bring up Google Maps. And I can have a look on Google Maps, follow the route of the ferry and just see what all these places might be. Garden Island. Yes! So where all those navy ships are is apparently a place called Garden Island. It doesn't actually look like an island. It looks like it's connected to the, the, the mainland, but apparently it's called Garden Island. And it is a Royal Australian Navy Heritage Centre. Also a signal station, which is a museum uh, rather than I think an active uh, signal station. So that's pretty cool. Maybe I'll visit that one day. So you can see over there, looking back towards the city, you can see the Westfield Tower, the big pointy one. Um, there's the Harbour Bridge.
bit more hardcore Henry stuff. To the right is Kirribilli, which is the first headland sticking out after. Oh no, Kirribilli is actually just right in front of the, to the right of the harbour bridge, just in front of it. And that's where the Prime Minister lives, although I'm pretty sure Albo is still in his house in Marrickville, but I could be wrong about that. Scott Morrison moved to Kirribilli House and apparently he took longer to leave than any other Prime Minister, is what I heard. I don't know. I don't know the relevance of that fact, but, you know, it's the only interesting fact I know about Kirribilli House. So there, there we go. That is the money shot. Look at that. You got the whole Sydney skyline. You got the Harbour Bridge, the Opera House. You got North Sydney to the right. You've got the CBD to the left. Um, and you can see to the right, it all turns very leafy. That is, there is Taronga Zoo, is part of that leafy area, I believe. Um, and also Mossman, which is super posh. It's like a very, very posh part of Sydney. Yeah, there we go. That bit with the lighthouse, that is Taronga Zoo, or it's, it's, a, it's near Taronga Zoo. It's uh, Bradley's Head. All right. What I really like about this trip as well, this ferry ride, is that there's actually, there are a lot of really good reserves on a lot of the headlands on the way here. So I believe what I'm looking at here is either, it might be Morella Road Reserve. Just This is just me looking at Google Maps. It could also potentially be George's Head, I actually, I don't know. I think, in fact, I think that's George's head to the right because it looks like there's a beach there. And that beach. I'm not going to try to name anything because I actually I could be way off. I could be completely off. I'm just guessing. But either way, it is some kind of um, reserve there. So you've got like the bush, and then to the left you've got like the city. It's a pretty cool contrast. Oh yeah. No, I think I think that I think what we're looking at is still Bradley's head, actually. And that little bit to the right is Clifton Gardens. Oh, that sounds very posh. It is odd. It, well, it seems odd to me anyway to have all this really low-density housing right near the city, but I suppose, you know, uh, wealthy people will be wealthy people. That's probably why it's so expensive, because not only is it in a very high demand location that is close to a lot of jobs and a lot of really nice things like the zoo, the harbour. Um, it's also low density so there's not much supply so then it's super expensive. There's the Manly Fast Ferry. They are kind of like Regular ferries, but private, and and by private I mean not publicly owned, not like exclusive. Um, they're more expensive. They don't do concession rates, which is a bit rubbish. But sometimes if I'm late for the ferry, I end up having to catch the fast ferry. It is faster. They it's a different type of boat. I don't know anything about boats, but it's a faster type of boat, and they serve beer on board. It's pretty. It's pretty spacky. You couldn't tell that this is. Sydney, could you, looking at this? Except for the hint of buildings off to the right there. But there, there was a moment there, just looking over all that bush, that you could have been just, you know, going by the Royal National Park or something. So I guess, you know, good on them for um, keeping plenty of the coastline um, as reserves. Alrighty. Manly. In fact, you know those buildings? No, actually no. I think I was right the first time. But yeah, those buildings ahead of us. That is Manly.
Now Manly is really interesting as far as its cycling infrastructure, as we're going to see soon. A few cormorants, a few pied cormorants flying past. Alright, uh, at this point I think I figured it was time to get back to my bicycle, get ready to alight the ferry. Old Nate's still having a good time back there, that's good, good on him, it's a nice commute. He looks a bit, he's kind of giving me a bit of a look there isn't he? Oh. Nor my very sketchy release of the, um, the the hook there. All right, there it is, Manly Wharf. It's a bit hard to see because of the sun, but yeah, there it is. To the left of it is not Manly Beach. That's another beach, Cabbage Tree Beach. Did you know? that the first uh, piece of fashion that was distinctly um, kind of of colonial Australia was the cabbage tree hat, which was a straw hat that I think mostly men wore and it was made out of the fronds of the cabbage tree which is a pretty groovy looking palm tree and when the wind go when the wind blows it kind of rattles which is the shape of the leaves and they were all over uh, the Sydney area still are actually quite a bit um, the Dharawal people I believe take their name from their word for the cabbage tree and Thurul is a kind of mishearing of which is the cabbage tree which is a, a it's kind of near waterfall I believe and it was named for the sheer amount of cabbage trees so here we are at Manly we've got a you know this this area is a bit sketchy cycling infrastructure wise but it's low traffic um, this is obviously just a painted lane but once again pretty low traffic and I think what works really well about Manly is it's got very wide footpaths, it's got very low speed limits. Um, so I think around here is mostly 30 or 40, but I'm not sure. It's got, as you can see here, the, the pedestrian crossing went off before the traffic light, which gives pedestrians a chance to get out onto the street and be visible before cars are given permission to go so that there's a higher chance that the car will give way. Lots of bike parking, lots of pedestrianised areas to the left, as you just saw. Um, you don't actually see that much here on the route that I take, but there is a significant portion of Manly that is entirely pedestrianised. Um, we got some fellas doing the Tour de France up here. I meant to ride on the path to the right, but I got a bit distracted by all these cycles. I was like, oh, yeah. these are they going this way, so I'm like, I instinctually follow them. To the left, all pedestrianized. They're doing a bit of maintenance work, but it's like all pedestrianized. Heaps of outdoor dining, heaps of people walking. Um, wide footpaths. And it helps that this is the beach, so it's a nice area to be outdoors around. Good quality raised pedestrian crossings. So what's interesting about Manly is I was kind of saying before, it's not so much the fact that they have spectacular cycling, bicycle infrastructure, which they don't. They have shared paths, and as you can see, they're safe enough for the even you know little kids to ride on, which is always a very good test to see if cycle infrastructure is actually safe, which is why painted bike lanes fail, because you would not want some eight-year-old kid riding on them. That's how you die. You've got old mate in a suit riding to work, I guess. Maybe he's going to catch the ferry. 
Um, look, more bike parking. Um, but no, the, the thing that I believe makes Manly so effective for cycling and why so many people cycling in Manly is A, because it's really pleasant. Because you got the beach, you got trees, you got all that good stuff. And B, it's because it's built uh, for pedestrian safety, which carries over to cycling safety. The pedestrianized areas are also very good for riding a bike. It's all about safety for everyone. And I think that's that's why it's so effective. But as you're going to see, it, you know, it's almost as if cycling is an unintentional... I mean, they have the shared path here and the cycling science here. Like, you know, on the ground, the picture of the bike and whatnot and the bike parking, but it's almost like the amount of cycling traffic that this gets is a an unintentional side effect of what the council maybe thought was gonna be, see it's getting pretty chaotic here, um, but it's maybe a side effect of what the council thought was gonna be a lovely recreational area. And then people were like, actually, this is really good to make it my commute every single day. You know, why, why should I get in the car and drive on like because and, and I mean there are some pretty unpleasant main roads around Manly not so much in Manly itself in fact Pitwater Road's a bit rubbish um, in Manly Vale you've got the A8 which is terrible terrible would not want to ride there or drive there rather so it's like the fact that there are these safe pedestrianized or not so much pedestrianized but car light see 30 kilometers an hour like car light areas around manly um the fact that there is not very much public transport and the fact that there is a lot of bike parking i think all combines to and that there is a very long recreational park all combined to make almost seems like it's by accident cycling a really attractive commute option that a lot of people choose uh, and we're about to see why that can go wrong or how it can go wrong rather and not because pigeons stand in the middle of the path that happens everywhere so obviously the main conflict is that people who are recreationally using these paths they might be walking slowly they might be walking unpredictably they often have dogs and I mean there are often a higher volume of people walking on these paths than is is conducive to I guess traffic flow so it's just it just hasn't it just hasn't been built with that in mind So lots of people going for jogs, lots of people just hanging out, lots of people walking their dogs. But also lots of people cycling. This path is too narrow for the amount of people that it carries. I think they should do what the Bay Run did, but obviously better than the Bay Run, and have a separated cycle path running parallel to this path. That guy is on a one wheel, which is sick. I like one wheels. So as you can see there, it's like, it just gets complicated. <laughs> Some dog tried to attack me. That person randomly walk, almost walked to the other side of the path as well. So it's, which is obviously like, I'm not, you know, not her fault, but it's just that this path is trying to be two things at once. They're kind of in conflict with each other. I swear I remember some dog running out in front of a bike and so, like almost getting hit. But I 
Maybe if you go back and watch it, you'll be able to spot it. But I swear I remember that happening. But I, I must have missed it watching us through. Um, because it's surrounded by a park where dogs are running around chasing balls and stuff as well, which is not conducive to carrying a large amount of bicycle traffic. And then obviously it leads onto the side of Pittwater Road, and this bridge is just super narrow. It. And you're meant to dismount your bicycle here. I think I do eventually. The person did. Yeah, good on them, I guess. But I think they need an ex they need to build another bridge here. A pedestrian and cycling bridge. Yeah, you can see I've given up I'm walking now, because old mate's crossing with, with his dog there. But yeah, no, once again another random kid on his way to school, so We've got, we've got kids using it, so obviously it's reasonably safe. Continuous footpaths, raised footpaths here would be, it would make it a lot safer, I think, because you need something to get people driving on a road that is very much designed for cars into a different mindset. Uh, that guy did say, so. he said, like he did verbally tell me that I could take overtake him. I didn't just like cut him off. Um, just wanted to put that out there. This guy is also cycling. I think he lets me overtake him as well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, mate. Um, that's one good thing about cycling. I don't. I think I was talking over him, like some random bloke at the lights, waiting at the lights with me on a bike at um, yeah, in front of the. The Western distributor back in uh, Lilyfield, like he was just like, "Oh yeah, how you going?" You know, um, so it's nice. You get all these little social interactions that just don't happen in cars. There are no footpaths here, which is strange. Which I would to I could totally get that if it was just like a slow shared zone, but that 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 is not how things work with parked cars on the side because they limit visibility, um, and they limit people's ability to overtake. And then you got the car door zone going on. So if that was the intention, it would have been good to not have parking on the side of the street and to have maybe a more textured surface pardon me like brick and also this the fact that this random car park is part of the walking and cycling link is to, to the park is a little bit weird but you know whatever. i mean it works and that'll just about wrap things up so i hope you learned a few things about cycling infrastructure. I hope you learned a few things about Sydney and I hope you found this commute as visually visually beautiful, as relaxing, as pleasant as I do whenever I do it. Because it is a really good commute and you know I think the takeaway should be that when we build cities around more space efficient more quiet modes of transport um that, that there are there are the opportunity there are the opportunities to build much more pleasant spaces around those modes of transport um but yeah thanks for watching <laughs>